says that before he went on his trip to England, he went to go visit Hunter, and then Hunter just, like, again, in, a, in another what the hell is wrong with you type of scenario, Hunter decides to lend him his red Woolrick hunting jacket and his correspondence raincoat. Well, and I say lent because it was rare for Hunter to give something outright. He might lend it indefinitely, but he wanted to know that he could get it back if he really wanted it. There was a handwritten list on the back of one of the kitchen cabinet doors that listed all the items he had lent to me over the years. <laughs> what? That is psycho behavior. Hey, how are you doing? Welcome to another episode of Stories I Tell Myself. This is the story of growing up with Hunter S. Thompson, and it was written by his son, Juan. It's been a while since we've had a chance to have another episode on this book. And so I will make sure that we go back and discuss. This section that we're reading is from ages 18 to 24. It's quite an extensive section of his life that he talks about, but I'm gonna try to see if I can cover it all today just because, um, I, because we're so behind in the book, having missed last weekend, I'd like to just cover as much as possible. So um, let's get right into it. Now, to jog our memories, um, if it's been a while since you saw the last episode. In that episode, Juan was going to college and he was nervous about going to college because he was on the East Coast again. You'll recall that when he went to boarding school, he had gone to a very elite, um, East Coast boarding school had been a terrible experience for him. And so he had gone back after just a few months back home. He'd gone to school in Colorado and the school was really similar to his previous school. Very small, very intimate. Um, and the educational approach was very different. Juan is an extremely bright individual, loves to read, scholastically gifted. So he ends up getting into Tufts and he's excited to go. Hunter is kind of his main parent during that part of his life. Sandy, having experienced the freedom of having a child in boarding school, um, and ha because Sandy had always been his primary parent and primary caregiver in all things, and because she'd had custody of him once she'd separated from Hunter, was really enjoying, sort of honestly, planting her wild oats. And she'd gone off to Europe and she was living in Turkey at the time. So uh, Juan was really on his own with only Hunter to rely on. Hunter is a very unreliable individual. And so he'd gone off to college. Hunter, though he hasn't been physically present, has always been monetarily present in Juan's life and has funded all of his very expensive education. But he has done it, um, I would say, somewhat begrudgingly. I mean... He, he does it knowing that this is some way that he can be a father to Juan. And I think he does want to be a father, but is very, like his selfishness really gets in the way of him being a good father. His selfishness really clouds all of his ambitions to be a present dad. Um, he knows what he should do, but it's like one of those things where my spirit knows what I should do, but my flesh is unwilling for me to do it type of thing. So at least paying for one school is one way that he feels like he hasn't totally lost control of the father-son narrative. When Juan goes to college, and especially since Sandy's out of the picture and Hunter now sees this is his opportunity to cultivate a relationship with Juan, he tells Juan, call me anytime. I want to be super involved in your life. Like, write to me. Please write to me. I want to get lots of letters. I will, you know, let's have lots of phone calls. Let's just really stay in touch, you know. And he also sort of sets up this whole narrative with Juan, this whole like fantasy that they both have, that they're going to write this series of books together. And, you know, it's going to be like this father-son writing team. And you sort of get the feeling when you're reading the book that Juan is being used by Hunter because Hunter was always sort of looking for the next writing thing he could do, like the next quick check he could get signed. Um, and so it's almost like he's cultivating this fantasy with Juan so that Juan can eventually sort of help him bear the brunt of his enormous debt. Uh, Hunter's terrible with money. And um, he, he says at the end of this letter that he gives to Juan, when Juan gets on the plane to fly away and Hunter gives him this letter that's outlining, you know, this is who, who you and I can be together. You know, I'm, I'm so proud of you. And um, you know, reiterating to him the fantasy of writing this series of books with him. And he says at the end, you know, like, well, you know, let's just hang the expense. You know, it's kind of one of those things we're going to have to make our peace with. But, you know, I, I really think there's going to be a lot of benefit for us in the offing if we can just like, you know, try to ignore the fact that this is so expensive. 
Juan has never honestly cared that school is expensive. He's always chosen very expensive choices for his education. And so it's almost like Hunter is saying that to sort of mollify his conscience, it's being pricked every minute that he's spending so much money on an education that he doesn't necessarily think is all that practical. But, um, so it's always these little comments in these letters that it, it just sort of feels like if I were one, and I would feel like there was this undercurrent of um, sort of passive aggression. You know, it's like, well, you know, I'm happy to do it. It's a huge burden, and you know, I'm not really quite sure how I'm gonna pull it off. You know, you'll be good. You'll never know it. But I mean, I'm 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 patching things together over here to make it a reality for you. So, the letter was a little bit weird. I thought the letter was weird. Um, but it got a lot weirder in their letter writing because Juan took his father up on the idea that they really were this really strong father and son bond. Both of them were leaping with both feet into this fantasy that they had never really had a blip in their relationship and that it had always been good all the time. And we, we know it had not been. Um, but both of them were cho choosing to ignore the reality in the hope of the possibility that things could really be uh, the traditional father-son roles that they'd always wanted from each other. So Juan believed his father and began writing letters to his dad that were very vulnerable, very um, open about the struggles he was having at school. Um, but what became really apparent too in those letters was that there was a son that was crying out desperately for his father to see him and to acknowledge him and to admire his writing. And when when Hunter got those letters, he did not receive them or respond to them in the way that he had told Juan he would. He told Juan, I can't wait to hear all about it. Every little thing, tell me all about it. You know, you're going to be dealing with homesickness, but I mean, we've dealt with despair before. Don't worry. Keep your head down. Keep working. You know, you'll get used to it. You'll find your footing, right? He'd had all of these like very fatherly things to say. But when fatherliness was actually expected of him in the face of Juan's vulnerability, Hunter was disgusted by it and then turned around and, you know, accused Juan, I guess you could say accused, it kind of sounded accu you know, accusatory, of not being honest. And what he suspected, what Hunter suspected of Juan was he thought that Juan was gay. He said, uh, you know, I had a friend who spoke very similarly to the way you are speaking now and it turned out that he was gay and, you know, we lost our relationship with each other because he wanted to go live his lifestyle and, you know, it just our paths never really meet, met because, you know, that's not my thing. And, you know, so he's like, you know, is there something you want to tell me is going on here? And that was not what Juan was trying to say at all. He was just trying to be honest and vulnerable with his dad. It wasn't like there was something shrouded in mystery. And and Hunter was super reading into the letter that he sent because there's like nothing in the letter that says, you know, that, that would even suggest he's struggling with his sexuality or anything like that. He's not struggling with how to define him. He's not struggling with how to define himself. He's struggling with being in a world where the culture is very different from the one he grew up in and he just feels very lonely and he's just also extremely socially awkward. But it's not a question of like, what is my sexuality? It's just like college is hard. So that's where we left off in the last episode. Um, I was really shocked by, by Hunter's attitude towards Juan in that entire episode. And it was just really apparent that Hunter is, he. if there's a choice between acting in a mature way and acting in an immature way, Hunter will always choose to act in the immature way. At this point, I got to tell you, and I mean, this is not like a new confession, but I don't like Hunter S. Thompson. And, and all of the things I've ever heard about him, I suspected that this would ultimately be my conclusion. I despise this man. I don't care what anybody says about his writing. It could be like the most brilliant thing in the world. Really? I feel like if I sat down to read his writing, I would probably be less than impressed. He just kind of feels like a cult favorite to me that people chose because he was an alternative to what was currently available. And like people liked his rebellious spirit. So they clung to something that of its own merit potentially may not be that good. I don't know. Full disclosure, I've never read anything by Hunter S. Thompson, not even one article. So who am I to say? But judging by his character, judging by the way that he dealt in life, it just makes me wonder how many insights he had. But he could be one of those people that has like incredible insights and knows all the right answers, but has zero potential for doing them in real life. It could be. All right. Okay. That was a really long intro, but that's, that's where we left off. He's gone to college. Things are terrible. Then uh, he did his 
freshman year, hated it the whole time. Um, he stuck it out because he was going to stick it out, but he was like, I got to find another college. This East Coast thing, I've tried it once, now I've tried it twice. It's just not happening for me. So that summer, between his freshman and sophomore year, his dad got him a job at Rolling Stone as some sort of intern. The time at the internship was helpful only in that it helped Juan to realize that he definitely did not want to be a journalist. That was not his cup of tea. But he writes that the highlight of that summer was meeting Susanna, a beautiful 26-year-old editorial assistant at Rolling Stone. She was permanent staff, and she got to write a couple of short items in the magazine now and then, but was essentially a secretary to the editors. She and I started dating, and at the end of the summer, she quit Rolling Stone. I finished my internship, and since I had not applied to a college besides Bennington, which Hunter had vetoed vehemently, we headed south to Florida to join my mother and William on her new 37-foot sailing boat on which they lived. We had some vague plans about going to India or maybe Europe. Okay, y'all, let me set the stage here, okay? 26-year-old Susanna, who had a job at Rolling Stone and could have worked her way up into something, decides, inexplicably, and it's never explained to us, to just quit her job and wander the world with this young 20-something-year-old. Okay, like, I think he's like 20, 21. Like, he's real young. Um, then they decide that they are going to go to Florida to meet up with Juan's mother. Now, we recall the last time we saw Juan's mother, she was drunk on the roof of a hotel telling a bunch of ghastly stories and embarrassing her son to such an extent that he left Turkey and went home, right? This is the last we knew of his mother. His mother's also dating somebody who is significantly younger than her. He's in his 20s. Um, he's like just a couple years older than, than Juan himself. And so they've decided that they are going to go and see mother and mother has married her boyfriend, the young, the young William. It's bad. But before we get into how bad it is on the boat, which I really wish Juan would have told us more details about the boat situation. That could have been a story in and of itself. He does give us a little bit of color about what sort of relationship he and Susanna had. Now, obviously, this is going to be a very maternal relationship. She's six years older than him. And she's just a lot more cosmopolitan than he is. He says that Susanna was an answer to my prayers. She was smart, funny, artsy, sarcastic, loved to read. And she liked me as I was, bowl cut and all. She became my person. And New York City transformed from a large and lonely place to an adventure. She was my mentor and lover. She introduced me to art movies. And she told me about new bands. And we talked about books. I loved her and was devoted to her. We weren't equals. I was her naive puppy dog and her pupil. But I was fine with this arrangement. I had a real girlfriend. And I was loved. And I wasn't alone. Essentially, he's found a replacement for old mother. Um, but it does seem like he was looking for something to sort of ease him from the mother-son relationship into a romantic relationship, and he's sort of chosen this hybrid individual. I truly don't know what Susanna's deal was. Um, because, I don't know about you, but that wouldn't be fun for that long. You know, I mean, it might be fun for a little while to be the one that, like, knows the things. You know, you know the cool music, you know the cool movies, you know... You get to be the smart one in the relationship and you get to be the one with the always with the upper hand, you know, that might be fun for a little bit, but I can tell you as a woman, I don't think that that would be fun for very long. Um, I don't want to be the leader. That could just be me. Um, I don't want to be trodden upon. I don't want to be uh, thought of as like lesser than, but I would way rather walk through life with an equal and somebody who can take the lead if need be, you know? Uh, so that, you know, that pe people might think that that's old fashioned of me, but this just seems like from my personal vantage point, something that I'm like, not at all surprised this didn't work out. Okay. So anyway, um, they decide to go to visit the mother. Remember this, they go and see Sandy, they go and see William. It's a terrible situation as one could have predicted. And Juan writes that the Turkey trip had been tense, but this trip to Florida could have been the basis for a Tennessee Williams play. Start with a 45-year-old woman and her handsome 27-year-old husband, because they'd gotten married a year before. Add her 20-year-old son, with whom she had had an unusually close relationship, and his attractive 26-year-old girlfriend, who happened to be almost the same age as her mother's husband. Add a heap of tension between Susanna and the mother. Put them all on a small boat for two months. Add some heat and my mother's fondness for wine at the time. And wait for the fireworks to start. Oh, wouldn't I dearly love to know every minute of the drama that had gone on in that boat. Well, of course the fireworks started, predictably so. 
He says, after two months, everyone was angry at everyone else. And Susanna and I fled the boat and went to Aspen. Now, why were they going to Aspen? Can somebody explain to me why Susanna had a job at Rolling Stone and then quit it to do this? I don't know. But she did, and she decided to follow him to Aspen because he was like, I guess that's where I'll go. I mean, that's home. Uh, he writes that why Susanna wanted to go to Aspen with a 20-year-old boy, he still can't figure. But maybe because she didn't know what the hell she was doing and she didn't have a better idea, like me. So at least he's honest about it. But, yeah, this is a weird life move for a 26-year-old who seems like she had things going for her. I don't know. I mean, it could have been, too, that as a writer, she was familiar with Hunter S. Thompson, and she thought that it was some sort of feather in her cap to be dating Hunter's son. I mean, I don't know. It could be that. I just don't understand. And, and you know, Juan might have been a lot of fun to hang around with, but it does seem weird that you would just sort of, like, abandon all pretense of a goal and then just sort of wander aimlessly. Well, he says, though, that he was really happy to have her along. She was his person. And it was just nice not to feel so terribly alone all the time, you know, and he'd felt that way for a long time. He says they bummed around Aspen. He got a job at the Explore Bookshop and she got a job as an executive secretary. And the plan had been that they would be house sitting at Owl Farm while Hunter had gone down to the Florida Keys. He's writing some book and he's got to do some research. We've talked about that before, but it doesn't seem really apparent what his research was supposed to be. Something about dialogue and getting the uh, sound of the dialogue correctly in his head. I don't know. But he keeps not doing it. Like he keeps saying, yeah, I'm packing up, I'm leaving, I'm going. And they're waiting and waiting and waiting because they're supposed to house sit for him. And it's like, okay, well, where are we going to stay down? You know, it's like, we came here with the express purpose of house sitting for you, but we're, you know, we're kind of bumming around over here. He said, while well, they waited for him to get ready. They stayed in a friend's basement about 15 miles from Aspen. And then they moved to a tiny apartment belonging to another friend. Um, it was just like bouncing from, place to play, squatting here, squatting there, waiting for Hunter. And he's just clearly, he doesn't have a care in his head that his son has come to house it for him, believing his dad was going away on a job. And then like his son is like effectively homeless. Juan says that this went on for several more months. Hunter was always on the verge, but never quite ready to leave. Eventually it became clear he wasn't leaving at all. And we found a long-term house sitting situation. He said they ended up staying in a lovely house in Old Snowmass, 20 miles outside of Aspen. And they just sort of began their life there. He worked at a local bookstore. And then he was also a maintenance man at um, some big piece of property. And it was this life of just sort of bumming around, you know, working these odd jobs that he just was like, why did I leave college? You know, here's the thing. I'm, I'm a strong believer that college isn't for everybody. I really don't believe that it is. I think that there are some things that people have to go to college for. I mean, my doctor better have gone to college. You know, that engineer, where's your degree? But I would say that most of us could read our way into intelligence. I certainly wish I hadn't gone to college and wasted the money on it because I've learned more on my own than I've ever learned from college. So I'm not saying that you have to go to college, but what I, I do think that college is helpful for people who need to be doing something productive with their time. Um, and like are, they struggle to be accountable in life on their own. So they need to go and like be taught how to be accountable. Like I got to, these are deadlines I have to meet. And this, these are meetings I have to go to with my professor. And this is, you know, I'm accountable to this, you know, this group project and stuff like that. If you're struggling with self-determination or kind of learning how to do that, I think college can be really an asset for you. And I would say that Juan may have fallen into that category. I think Juan could have taught himself anything he wanted to, but I think that maybe being taught how to have a goal was maybe a good thing for him. So he's realizing I got to go back to college. This life without a plan or a goal was one that I couldn't bear. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I knew I couldn't stay in Aspen and that I had to get back to school. Hunter had gotten to the point where he wasn't opposed to showing his true colors to this girlfriend of Juan's. One night they had gone over to see Hunter. He'd invited them over to dinner. So they went and they, they had dinner. And then they were standing in the living room by the front door, sort of talking, you know, on their way out the door for the evening. And as they were talking in the living room, Hunter's eyes scanned his bookshelf and he realized that some of his books were missing. And rather than say, hey, did you borrow some of my books? No, we can't be normal about it. He says that Hunter got angry. And though he didn't accuse me directly about the missing books, it was clear that he suspected us of taking them. I took the logical approach. I didn't take the books, and I didn't know who had, and there was nothing more to say. However, he would not drop the subject. 
In an angry tone, he told us how he hated being looted. As if dwelling on the topic would somehow dislodge more information from us. Like, oh, oh, well, since now that you've mentioned it seven times, I guess I do remember coming here, sneaking in during the night and just ravaging your bookshelves. I didn't know what more to say. I was uncomfortable and I just wanted to leave. Susanna took a different approach. She became defiant and emphatically denied taking any books. He and Susanna stared at each other. And then Hunter backed down and said something about how sometimes he just had to yell. You know, when you get that urge, you just got to lay into somebody and rip their face off. One of those feelings came to me. You understand. She said, well, can I yell too? And then Hunter smiled and hugged her and said that sometimes we have to go through these things. <laughs> what a weird exchange and super embarrassing if you were one. I'd be like, oh my gosh. Oh, I just want to get out of here so bad. Why is my dad such a weirdo? Why is he telling my girlfriend that sometimes we just need to yell at each other? I saw in that exchange that Hunter respected strength and that sometimes, but not always, a fierce response would settle him down and sometimes it would spur him on to greater wrath. I could never be sure which. My father was a warrior, but he was not a philosopher. See, what a tricky individual this would be to have to be around. You know, it's like, how do you know when to play the strength card? And, and how do you know that poking the beast isn't going to, like, make him rear up and tear you limb from limb? You know, it's like, I wouldn't know what to do. And I'm not surprised that Juan took the position of being like, I don't know. I'm not sure. I just want to go. You know, he is not new to the fight. He's been in many, many, many a fight. You know, and he's seen the carnage and the emotional waste that comes from interfering with his dad. You know, does it shock me that he was like tiptoeing around the posies? No. Susanna's new to this game, so she was willing to rip roar him. And if she took that approach with Hunter more than once, I guarantee you he would have knocked that girl down. She still knew enough that he respected that she would stand up to him. He, he, she does that again, he would eviscerate her. The whole year seems unreal and disconnected. Susanna and I were not living towards something. We had no intention of getting married or having children. We were together almost by accident, like two survivors on a raft taking solace in each other's company, drifting with the current. The best thing that came out of that year was a strong desire to get back to school. He applied to the University of Colorado, and he was pretty much a shoe in and the state tuition sure made Hunter happy, so everyone was glad for this new turn of events and this goal. Susanna didn't care about Aspen at all, so she was more than willing to follow him to the University of Colorado in Boulder. And in August, they moved what few possessions they had, and they started their new lives. They both got jobs, and he says that what was a little bit weird about school this go around was that every other time he'd had a college experience or the boarding school experience, he'd gone in as a freshman. So he was, it was uh, mandatory that he mingle with the freshmen and have these like little get together kumbayas. But now that he's a sophomore and uh, doesn't have to live on campus, he really had no connection whatsoever to the school. Didn't have any friends. He went on campus, went to class, left. That was my college experience also. Uh, on the one hand, that was great. You know, go about your business, you know, behold to no man. But it also meant that he didn't have any connections. But he had Susanna. She was his friend. And so he didn't really feel the necessity to make very many relationships work because what does he need them for? Susanna's good. Still, though, looking back on it, he says, uh, I've heard the phrase playing house. And that's what we were doing. We were just playing house. I was enjoying it, not knowing any better. We had a wonderful apartment, we had a routine, and I had a best friend in Susanna. But there wasn't a lot of I don't I don't I don't think it was like one of those relationships where you're just head over heels for the person. It was just like this is really comfortable, you know? And you know, I in some ways there's there's something to be said for those really comfortable relationships where it doesn't feel like everything has to be a fight to stay on on good footing, you know? It's like that's, I guess, exciting to some degree, especially when you're younger. You know, you, you, you substitute love and affection for the high of the fight and then the makeup, you know. And you think that that means that you're, like, really emotionally uh, and almost spiritually invested in the person with the high and the low of everything. But, you know, that gets wearing. You know, so I can see why he wasn't like looking to break up with the girl. Everything feels, you know, it feels good. I can also guarantee you, though, that she probably didn't think it was as great as he did. It that Thanksgiving, Hunter called and said he was in Denver and proposed we get together. This was short notice. 
but Susanna and I had no other plans, so we agreed. We considered having dinner at our apartment, but we had only two chairs, so we decided we'd better to go to a restaurant. And they did. And the thing is, is that, for the most part, it looked on the outside like, oh, this, you know, a couple of normal people getting together and, you know, going out for Thanksgiving dinner. Well, it was the first and last time Hunter ever came to his house for anything like Thanksgiving. Hunter was really bad at making overtures to Juan and getting them together as father and son. If Juan did not try to make it happen, or if the girl of the moment didn't try to step in and, you know, be like, hey, Hunter, you haven't seen your son in a while. Maybe, we, you know, we should go over to his house or you can come over here or something like that. It just didn't happen. Anyway, for whatever reason, it was happening at this point, and Hunter had a new girlfriend. So before, his girlfriend had been Layla. We know Layla. Layla was the one who said to Juan, hey, I think your dad has a real drinking problem. And Juan was like, I don't know, everybody drinks, you know. So he didn't take Layla up on that yet. In this chapter, he's going to dig into that a little bit more. But the previous girlfriend had been Layla. Layla's gone. She's a thing of the past. There's a new girl now. Her name's Maria. Maria was his new assistant and his lover. She came to Thanksgiving as well. And he said that this was the first time he'd ever met Maria. She was petite, as Hunter's women tended to be, and young, beautiful, and very intelligent. They always were. My second impression was of her kindness and sincerity. They came inside for a bit, and then we went to the restaurant in the Hilton for Thanksgiving dinner, just the four of us, in a practically abandoned dining room. It was a, pretty st it was a strangely stereotypical scene. My father and his beautiful girlfriend came to visit his son and his girlfriend at college, except his girlfriend was younger than mine. Hunter asked Susanna to pick the wine. We had a quiet and polite conversation with no yelling or embarrassing scenes. What a revelation. The only hints that this was not a normal family were Maria's age, 23, and the fact that she was assisting him with his article on the notorious Mitchell brothers and their O'Farrell Theater, a large and upscale strip club in San Francisco. That and the number of whiskeys Hunter finished off during and after dinner. On the way home, we stopped at Liquor Mart for a big bottle of Chivas, and when we parted at the curb at our apartment, Hunter handed Susanna an empty whiskey bottle to dispose of. In Hunter's world, this was normal, like asking someone to throw away an empty Starbucks cup. Okay, so an, an odd evening, but at least he didn't act weird or crazy at the dinner, you know. But that is strange. I mean, he's dating somebody who is like his son's age, younger than his son's girlfriend. She's his assistant. I mean, really, I mean, I say it's odd. I wouldn't expect not even one thing differently from Hunter. One of the most difficult paradoxes in Hunter's character was the presence of both a strong, genuine caring for others and a profound self-centeredness. Yeah, y'all, this story is weird, but it, it is the perfect story to highlight the petty self-centeredness that is so particular to Hunter. He says at one time he went over to Owl Farm and he and Maria were talking about one thing and another. Maria explained that they were having some kind of issue with the computer. Juan was very computer savvy. And so she'd gone in to the office with Juan so that she could show him what the problem was and hopefully he could fix it, right? Very normal. Nothing's going on. There's an actual problem here and Juan could fix it. Hunter was in the kitchen at the counter in his usual post-waking ritual of reading the paper, watching a game and nibbling on breakfast. We were in the office for 10 or 15 minutes when suddenly the lights went out and the computer went dark. It, left, it lasted maybe 15 seconds, and then the power came on again. I assumed it was a power grid problem. After all, Owl Farm is in the country and power outages weren't unusual. But Maria turned to me and said, He wants us back in the kitchen. It took me a few seconds to comprehend what she meant. What she seemed to be saying was that Hunter had turned off the power in that part of the house to flush us out. She explained to me that Hunter could not bear to not be the center of attention and that he had reached the limits of his patience. 10 or 15 minutes, and he's trying to flush his son out. Interesting. So they walk back into the kitchen, and there's Hunter there trying to act like he doesn't know anything about it. You know, just, but, but so invested in the paper, newspaper article he's reading that it's very clear he's trying to look busy. Maria confronted him with something like, well, that was very childish, Hunter. He didn't respond. Yet he didn't deny it either, as though now that he'd gotten what he wanted, he was going to continue his morning uninterrupted. Hunter often quoted in his writing a bit of political wisdom, never apologize, never explain. And that is precisely what he did that day. I think he was also jealous of any friendship between Maria and me. 
I understood after that incident that my father was in some ways like a small child who could not imagine that the world did not center on him alone. Now, it would appear that whenever Hunter was around Juan, he did try to sort of shore up his frailties as a human being. You know, he, he seems like he was giving it his best effort most of the time. And Hunter was a exceptionally outraged person all the time at everyone, but also at himself. He knew that he was very limited in his ability to stand up against temptation and it really made him angry. And so he would, he would often punish those around him, but also try to punish himself uh, for failing. And so it was, he was a very difficult person to be around because he was always angry and he was always frustrated and he was always looking to punish somebody or something. And whatever demons were inside of him, he could not get a hold of them and it made him feel out of control. And so he was often raging about that. Juan says that whenever he was around his dad, he didn't see it. But Deborah, remember his dad's, um, it was kind of like his dad's personal assistant. They were never lovers, but Deborah was the one who knew, knew Hunter the most and was kind of like, uh, like the steadying, like his rock. Deborah was Hunter's rock and kind of kept him on an even keel, made sure his bills were, were paid, make sure that his appointments were, were kept, kept him from like caving in on himself. She says that Hunter was out of control most of the time. During these years, Juan says that Hunter was on his best behavior uh, whenever Juan was around. He writes, things were much worse when I was not around. To those poor suffering saints or masochists who subjected themselves to Hunter daily for years and sometimes decades in Deborah's case, Hunter could be a monster. I rarely saw these excoriations and only occasionally heard about them. To be with Hunter day after day while he was flogging himself, flaying himself with guilt, shame, and fear, trying to provoke within himself the energy, no matter how vile and poisonous its source, to complete whatever assignment was in front of him, was to witness something truly terrible. To see him turn his pent-up frustration against himself was in some ways the most painful, because he was relentless and complete in his self-degradation and despair. More often, though, he turned it outward against those around him, vicious, blistering verbal or written attacks. He was always a physically powerful man, even into his 60s, but it wasn't physical violence that you had to worry about. It was the verbal attack. Hunter could be a Southern gentleman, particularly with beautiful young women whom he had recently met and was trying to seduce. With interviewers, he could be similarly charming, but with those who knew him best, who lived with him day after day, he was always brilliant, often monstrous, sometimes tender and funny, occasionally supportive, but never gentlemanly. There is a reason that no woman lasted more than four or five years, and as time passed closer to two, he was impossible to live with. Over time, he just wore his women out. And then we go on to talk about his approach towards women, his approach towards his girlfriends. As he got older and older, those girlfriends stayed the same age, you know? And, you know... As Juan's getting older, his dad's still dating women who are like way younger than Juan. You know, it's like his women were always between 20 and 25. He says that uh, I find that I mark time in Hunter's life according to the significant relationships that he was in. There was Layla, and that's the girlfriend. That's his most recent girlfriend that we had known before Maria. There was Layla. She had a long run. She was with him for six years, so Layla should get an award. And then there was Maria, who made it for four or five years. Following her was Terry, who made it for a couple of years. Then Nicole for another couple of years. And then one after another, there was Madeline and Heidi and Anita. Um, and he, he married Anita a little more than a year before his death. So he must have liked her pretty good. But maybe not that much because he didn't stick it out with her. There were a lot of other girlfriends. He doesn't really know how much. He doesn't really know how many there were. But they're always really young. Like I said, they're always in their 20s. Layla was like an older sister since I was 16 and she was maybe 24. Maria was closer to my age, a year or two older. And by the time Nicole came into his life, I was older than her at 32 and she was probably 25. Hunter and I grew older, yet his women stayed about the same age. I learned a lot about Hunter through his women, either from them directly or from watching the growth and maturity and demise of the relationships. They always began real hopefully, you know, and Hunter was a charmer at the beginning you know he knew the right things to say he loved 
the feeling of falling in love. It was another addiction to him, you know, and that really heady space you're in when you when you meet somebody and you want to know everything about them and you want to talk all the time and you just think they hung the moon and everything they say is so funny and they're so witty and they're so charming and they're so awesome and that feels amazing who doesn't love the those those like those first few weeks and months in a, of a relationship and hunter really loved it you know and he loved the hunt and the pursuit of these young girls it was in in a lot of ways a sport to him Hunter didn't ask me what my opinion of any of these women were. Um, he had his own reasons. He wasn't interested in my opinions of, of his women. After the new woman and I had negotiated the initial awkwardness and we had accepted each other, there arose a kind of unspoken collaboration between us and alliance of understanding, particularly with Layla, Maria, and Nicole, the women he loved most deeply. There was the initial phase of hopefulness in which the love between them was so evident this was a part of his life that he did not share with me. But from his letters, I can see what a delicate suitor he was. Romantic letters, faxes, notes, late night rendezvous, road trips, flights to New York, LA, or some exotic place, and the complete attention of a very charismatic, famous, in some circles anyway, older man, must have been a powerful impression on young women. But I think that serially romanticizing women is just another form of his addiction to ego. I think that Hunter is probably one of the most profoundly self-centered people I've ever read about. Um, somebody who struggles immensely to say no to himself. And I think that his, his love of falling in love is an indication of how much he loved himself. So many times in those days, the reason it's so fun is because you have somebody worshiping you the way you would love to be worshiped all the time. And that's why a long relationship is so much harder because this person is no longer always worshiping you in the way that you had wanted to be worshiped. They are somebody you cannot depend on, but they also see you for all the things that you are too. And you see them for all the things they are too. Yet the choice to stay in that relationship is more loving than any of the things they said to you at the beginning, because now they know who you are. But you know, all that, you know, fun, flirtatious banter and all this kind of goes out of the way because both people are approach beginnings of relationships as I'll worship you if you'll worship me, you know, and then you find out like together we're so much more than just, you know, floating each other's boat constantly. I realize now that it was usually, maybe always, his girlfriends and later Deb who orchestrated his family gatherings, such as that Thanksgiving in Boulder. It's not that Hunter didn't want to see his family, it was that he was incapable of initiating it. It was the same, I'm sure, when Hunter and Layla spent Christmas with Hunter's brother Davidson and his family in Ohio several year years earlier. No doubt Hunter had been meaning to reach out, feeling guilty after every Christmas, Thanksgiving, and birthday that he failed to contact his family, yet he never seemed able to translate his guilt into action. It was up to the new woman in his life to actually make it happen. Oh, yes. I've known people like this. Um, for whatever reason, the guilt never does seem to weigh heavily enough on them that they would choose a different route. And part of me thinks that people who function like this, who are racked with guilt and yet seem to make no determining action so that they don't have to feel that way, seem to believe that if they go and interact with the thing that they feel guilty for ignoring then they will be reminded of all the times with that person that they let that person down. And it seems like they believe that if I start interacting with that person again, the guilt will actually be louder. If I just pretend that my loved one doesn't exist, then that means I don't have to interact with all the ways I've failed them in the past. But if I go and spend time with them, then I'm going to see their face. I'm going to remember all the times I did them wrong. I'm going to feel bad the whole time that I've wasted time not being with them. So I'll just keep not doing it. I feel guilty now, but the alternative, I'll feel worse, you know, so I just won't do it, you know. Perhaps I knew this deep down, but it didn't matter. Whatever his reason for visiting us that Thanksgiving in 1984, I was glad to see him. Then he tells us a very curious story about how his father decided to ring in his 21st birthday. All right, so you remember that he and Maria had been working on some kind of article about the O'Farrell Theater, um, which is a strip club in San Francisco. Notorious. And... <laughs> Like the deranged father that he is, he decides to invite his son to the O'Farrell Theater and, you know, show him the ropes. Because 
Hunter is not just writing a story about it. You know, Hunter's whole thing, this whole gonzo journalism thing, is where he goes and he lives the experience and then he writes some sort of hyperbolic tale about, you know, the wild doings of his life. So, you know, what is more... What is more conducive to that style than for him to go hang out in a strip club for a while? And he'd become quite the regular. In fact, they'd even give him an office there. So he says, why don't you come uh, to San Francisco with me? I'm doing some work at the uh, strip club. Why don't you come and hang out for a, for a hot sec? So they go. He says, that night Hunter took us to his office, just like any father might do, except in this case it was the O'Farrell Theater. His office was a large room on the second floor with windows that overlooked the street and resembled a recreation room from the basement of a suburban home with a pool table in the middle of the room, black leather couches around the walls, and a variety of art and trophies. There's probably a bar as well, but I was aggressively opposed to alcohol at the time, so I took no notice of that. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting that he would not at this point acknowledge that his father had a drinking problem, yet be super opposed to alcohol himself? There was a tiny office off to the side with a couple of 1950s metal desks, two small windows and fake wood paneling that reminded me of a trailer, but the rec room was clearly the heart of the operation. This is where Hunter and the Mitchell brothers held court, surrounded by beautiful women. This whole thing sounds sickening, but it gets worse. He told us about the various rooms in the theater. There was the movie theater that showed porn flicks, the New York Live stage show, the Ultra Room, and the Copenhagen Room. He said one room involved naked women, a dark room, and customers with flashlights. What? Well, another of the rooms had a live peep show. The whole scene was, of course, titillating and awkward for me. And became more so when Hunter led Susanna. But Susanna's with him? Okay, he, Hunter's leading him and his girlfriend Susanna. Through the dancer's dressing room to the soundstage booth overlooking the New York live stage. I was intensely aware of walking by beautiful, partly or wholly naked women, standing and chatting in front of their lockers like guys in a locker room, completely unconcerned by his presence. I, of course, averted my gaze and tried to act casual, as if I were walking down an aisle at Target. The show was in full swing. In the booth, standing next to the lighting technician, I could see a woman stripping on stage to music, and at the end of the performance, disappearing off stage and reappearing a few minutes later in the audience, dressed in lingerie. Hunter explained that they were providing lap dances, leaving the details to my imagination. This is so weird. This is so weird. Your son is 21. Like, I mean, is this, is this the heritage that you want to invest in your son? Like, let's just go objectify women together, you and me, and like your girlfriend can come too? God help us. When I think Back on it now, I wonder what Hunter was up to. He knew, of course, that it would be awkward for me, especially with Susanna there, and I think he wanted to see how she would react. I can imagine that it was always interesting to bring a self-proclaimed feminist to the O'Farrell and watch her reaction. Sometimes it was genuine curiosity that motivated his probing, and sometimes it was just the prankster at work. But I realize now that for all his courage and public madness and the power of his words, Hunter was very circumspect when it came to matters of the heart. In the national media, he called Nixon a predatory shyster full of claws and bleeding string warts. But when it came to those he loved, he would not speak directly and said he would observe and sense. Yeah, it's very interesting. He seemed not to be at a lack of articulation, except for when you were somebody that he actually cared about. And then he would never seem to be able to ask questions that would bring forth transparent see in each other it was always sort of like dancing around and he's observing and he's sort of coming to his own conclusions and inferences but he doesn't seem able to ask questions of Juan that would create open communication and dialogue he says I think that Hunter for all his mastery of language who could speak so clearly elegantly and with the power through the word ultimately found them inadequate it was as if to speak too plainly about a delicate topic was like looking at the sun with no eye protection. It is too bright, harsh, and unendurable. Better to filter it to see the subtle details, the fine points. Instead of asking me how I was handling the divorce, he would invite me out to Owl Farm for a weekend and just observe me. Perhaps ask how Sandy was doing, but not in a sneaky or deceptive way, but in a searching and exploratory way so that I didn't know even that I was being examined. And it seems that he brought... One here to the strip club to see how he would handle that sort of environment like he wanted to see 
maybe what the baser masculinity was in his son, particularly because he had had questions about his son's sexuality before. Did he bring him here to be like, I want to make sure, yeah, like I know you're dating Susanna, but you guys are pretty roommatey. You know, are you affected whatsoever? Do you like what you see? Like, why did he bring him there? Other than perhaps to gauge his son's reaction to a hyper-sexualized environment. All that time, I thought Hunter was not paying attention, but he was paying close attention to me. On the other hand, what did he know about fathering? His own father had died when he was a teenager. Maybe he was just winging it, trusting his instincts, hoping for the best. I believe now that he was paying attention and that he always loved me, but that's not the same thing as fathering. Yeah, I'd go ahead and say that his fathering situation was um, stunted. Stunted, stunted in the fathering department. I think we can all come to that conclusion. Then he talks about how he decided to do his junior year um, in England and do a year abroad. He'd had a friend from his boarding school days who said that she had gone to France and, and uh, you know, had kind of an adventure in France and was saying that, you know, I highly recommend it. If you can manage it, you should take a year abroad and go to school. So he decided he'd go to England. And... It was at this point that he and Susanna decided that they honestly should part ways. I mean, like, both of them were like, well, what are we really doing here? Like, we don't, we're not looking to be with each other forever. We don't want kids together. We're kind of just hanging out, being each other's besties. But, like, I think we can both do more for ourselves than this. So Susanna decided she was going to move back home to Virginia, where she was from. He was going to go to England. They didn't really break up, but they also were very much like, hey, you know, we'll see what happens. But, you know, you go your way, I'll go mine. And sort of just... We'll drift apart, but we won't make it like a hard breakup. Just kind of like, yeah, let's just go do our own thing. We'll just see what happens, you know, and they just definitely didn't meet back up again after that. He also decided that before his year in England started, he and his friend Stevens were going to go to Russia. And he spends a long time talking about the trip to Russia and what they saw. Um, it's it's interesting, but it's not all that interesting. So I'll I'll just, I'll leave that out of the review only because, I mean... He just talks about the different stops they, they made. Nothing super surprising happens. I mean, he experienced what life in a communist country is like. You know, people dreadfully poor. There's nothing in the market. Being offered good money for the Levi's he was literally walking down the street in. You know, things like that. Not that that isn't interesting, but I mean, it's not. There, there aren't any stories that he's telling that you're like, oh, I didn't know that that's how Russia was then. You, you know it. When Stephen and I returned three weeks later to the United States, it was time to pack up the apartment in preparation for England and for, and for Susanna to head back home to Virginia. He says that before he went on his trip to England, he went to go visit Hunter. And then Hunter just like, again, in, a, in another what the hell is wrong with you type of scenario, Hunter decides to lend him his red Woolrick hunting jacket and his correspondence raincoat. Well, and I say lent because it was rare for Hunter to give something outright. He might lend it indefinitely, but he wanted to know that he could get it back if he really wanted it. There was a handwritten list on the back of one of the kitchen cabinet doors that listed all the items he had lent to me over the years. <laughs> what? That is psycho behavior. Like, okay, I'm going to let you borrow this, this jacket. Like, buy your kid a coat then. Like, if you don't want to lend it for indefinitely, if you don't want to just give it to him, then, like, go buy your kid a coat. What is wrong with this person? Here's his jacket, but I better see it again. Okay. Hunter was a deeply sentimental man, and like most sentimentalists, he was a pack rat. Because such people, and I am one, confer an, on objects the essence of a person, place, or event. So maybe that's why he just could not get rid of things and wanted to have them back, you know, just in case he wanted to, like, I don't know, bury his nose in the red Woolrick jacket and remember all his hunting trips. I mean, I don't know. But Hunter was a person who couldn't let things go. And Juan writes that Hunter's house was filled with memorabilia, showcasing this inability to get rid of things. The kitchen walls, a couple of layers thick, with letters, pins, photographs, newspaper clippings, notes, posters, postcards, invitations, contact sheets, awards, proclamations, memos, flags, scarves, bar coasters, buttons, and anything else that could be held up by tape or pushpin. The lower layers were usually ragged around the edges and tinted the deep yellowish brown of cigarette smoke, for they had been on the walls for 20 years or more. And then on every surface, there was just junk. Junk, 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 junk. I mean, no wonder this guy feels depressed. Could you feel happy in a home like this? 
Every horizontal surface had things on it. Statues, figurines, stuffed animals, bones, knives, balls, boxes of, un of, boxes of filigreed silver, inlaid bronze, trays of ebony, an abalone shell, all things that he had been given or had, he had collected during his life at Owl Farm. And in the years before that, when he had traveled like a nomad around the country, becoming a writer, Owl Farm and everything in it angered him. Juan goes on to describe what Owl Creek had become to Hunter at this time in his life. Um, he had never intended to settle in, in Colorado. In fact, he, he wanted to continue that nomadic lifestyle. But there was something to having a home base. And home base sort of just gave him the stability that nothing else in life had ever given him. Juan says that when he bought the house, he transformed it into his own creation. The war room downstairs where he wrote Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. The living room, which was one of the three hearts of the house, along with the kitchen and the bedroom. He says that after 1980 or so, the kitchen became the creative and social heart. With satellite television and no wife and child to distract him, it was natural that he would take up residence there. And that friends and visitors could find him there. With football, basketball, CNN, or the Playboy Channel in the background, he wrote, talked on the phone, entertained guests, screamed, ate, threw things read the newspaper, did his drugs, told stories for the next 25 years. Then there's the land itself. Land and space were very important to Hunter. Hunter having privacy and space around him where he could, be, he could not be hassled or evicted, where he could sit on the porch naked, and where he could shoot large caliber pistols from his front doorway were all very important to him. This was a place where he could be uninhibited and nobody was ever going to question him, and nothing made him angrier than being questioned. No one could question or try to stop him because it was his land, his domain. As he said once in an interview, the United States was probably the only country in the world where he could live as he did. Few others would have tolerated him. So, uh, Hunter decided to scrape together what generosity he could out of his stingy soul and gave his correspondence coat to his son. Uh, you know, let this thing go for a little while, this very sentimental object that he had, his correspondence raincoat going to lend it to his son while his son went to England. Um, and along with that, he also gave Juan, for that year, the rent from the tenant in the cabin next door. It was $550 a month. And that was going to give Juan enough to buy food, books, clothes, and some money for travel, if he could find a way to travel cheaply on the weekends. And they're very generous of Hunter, honestly, because that, that was his only steady income. But it did make Juan's life much simpler because I did not have to wonder each month if I was going to get any money, and it removed the need for desperate transatlantic phone calls in which I would have to nag him. It was generous, and it was wise, the wisdom of a man who knows himself. You know, can I just say real quick that I'm a little bit annoyed by Juan's description of himself as always needing his father to finance his destiny. I don't know if, it, if he sort of bought into the idea that, like, we've well, never been a dad anyway, so the least you can do is pay for my college. But, like, he's 21 years old now. And for him to be like, I know, Dad, this is your only steady income and you're really bad with money, but it's really wise that you give it to me because then I'll have to call you for money. Well, you're an able-bodied man. Go get your own job. Why are you dependent on your dad at this point? You know, I sort of feel, it, it sort of feels like I don't know why Juan is allowing himself to be in a position with his father where he knows his father could very likely and shockingly hasn't let him down yet but very likely could at any moment it seems like he's always sort of testing the waters there like hey dad i really need this are you going to provide for me oh you're not he knows his dad's not good with money so why is he taking the one bit of income that his dad could use his dad is getting older his dad has like a lot of problems and stuff like that it just kind of seems like you're able-bodied and young one i know you want to sow your wild oats and you know travel the world and you know go to turkey when you want to and go to england for a year and all this but when are you going to finally decide that hey it's you know I'm just going to go do my own thing and finance my own dream. That's just me, but it's a little bit annoying to me. So anyway, he goes to England, meets a bunch of the, his fellow students from the University of Colorado. Um, he didn't actually know any of those people. He just knew that they were from his school. Um, and once again, he was alone. And you know how he doesn't do very well being alone. Um, it's just like when he was in Tufts and just like in New York before he met Susanna. And that first night when he was in London, he walked in the grass behind the school and hidden out in the dark and in the trees and feeling so lonely and forsaken, he literally lay down on the ground and just sobbed for a long time. He was back to feeling alone. There was no more Susanna. There was no more comfort of that, you know, relationship. He was going to have to try all over again to find his footing in an environment where he just does not know how to interact socially. But... After he'd cried and he couldn't cry anymore, he went back inside. And there was a Chinese student who felt 
as awkward as he did but the chinese but the chinese student said hey they're having this dance why don't we go you know why should we sit around here so he did end up going and he says i ended up dancing much to my surprise and after the dance a handful of us who had met went back to someone's room we drank tea and we talked for another hour or two and that night it all changed i became myself though i hardly knew it at the time it seems like that was a real turning point for him to put himself out there and not to reject it. There's many times when he had been in the group, but outside the group by his own choosing, by bringing a book to read, by subscribing to the newspaper so he could read at meals and had to talk to people. For the first time, he had decided like, okay, whatever activity they're doing, I'm going to do it even if I feel stupid doing it. And that was a dynamic change for him. We're going to stop there. It's the top of the hour. Um, but I, so we haven't finished the bit about him from 18 to 24, but we'll pick it back up when we come. He is in England. He has found a new way to exist in the world. And it's going to really serve him well from here on out that he's learned the lesson of you got to fight the awkwardness and then it passes. Right. But if you never fight the awkwardness, the awkwardness will have dominion over you and you will always feel alone and desperately, desperately sad. Um, that is it for now. But uh, I will see you again at the next episode. And thank you all so very much for spending some time with me and going through stories I tell myself. If you didn't see the video that I put out recently about what book comes after this, what our next weekend book will be, it is a book on RFK Jr. So um, once we're done with stories I tell myself, it only gets better from here. So thanks again for watching and I'll see you later. Bye.